We're celebrating in this beautiful blue sky day uh, vision research. And today we have a fantastic speaker and contributor to vision research. And uh, with more detail, we'll ask our student to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Alan Taylor. He is a dedicated scientist and leader in the fields of ophthalmology, nutrition, and molecular biology with over 40 years of experience in research, teaching, and scientific diplomacy. He completed his PhD at Rutgers University studying organic chemistry and did his postdoctoral work at UC Berkeley studying biochemistry. He currently serves as a director of the Laboratory for Nutrition and Vision Research, where his team investigates the role of nutrition in prolonging vision by preventing or delaying age-related eye diseases, including age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, and cataracts. His laboratories discovered a way to delay macular degeneration for over 100,000 people in a five-year period, as well as open up new opportunities for pharmaceutical intervention. He has published over 230 scientific articles and reviews in two books. In addition to his research, he has been a consultant to pharmaceutical and ophthalmologic companies, an invited keynote speaker, and an editor for peer-reviewed journals such as Molecular Aspects in Medicine. After his experience as a senior Fulbright scholar in Israel, he founded the Science Training Encouraging Peace Graduate Training Program, also known as JEP TTP. This program promotes scientific collaboration between Israeli and Palestinian students to foster peace through shared research initiatives. He has received numerous prestigious awards, including the Osborne and Mendel Award for Excellence in Nutrition Research, the Denman Harmon Award for Excellence in Aging Research, and the Pfizer Consumer Healthcare Nutritional Science Award for his con contributions to eye research. With his expertise and dedication to research and international collaboration, Dr. Taylor continues to lead in the fields of aging and vision science, making lasting contributions to public health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Taylor for the seminar titled, Limit Risk for AMD by Eating Lower Glycemic Index Diet. Did I begin? Well, should I begin now, Tim? Yes. Okay. So thank you all for this very kind inf introduction and a kind invitation. And um, I have to tell you that the introduction is way overstated. Um, I, I hope that we can eventually save people from AMD. So far, we're able to save mice from AMD. Um, so we'll have to take that, that introduction with some grains of salt. And I have recently stepped down as the director of the Lab for Nutrition and Vision Research. A lot of the work is being picked up by Sheldon Rowan and uh, other people who moved to other places. Um, but we'll stay involved um, as we begin this human study, which I'll tell you about at the very end. So the people whose names are shown in red here are the major players in the talk that I'll give today. There are lots of other people um, involved, but um, I don't have time to acknowledge every person involved. And I do want to thank our supporters, the NIH, USDA, the Tom Memorial Research Foundation, and Macular De Degeneration Research Foundation. And the people whose has are circled in this picture are some of the major contributors on the upper right, Sheldon, in the middle, Sarah, um, and uh, to her left, Gemma, and to the left of her, Eloy. These are people who made major contributions and whose work I'll cite today a lot. Um, these are the publications, and I won't go through them now, but since the, court, uh, the lecture's been recorded, and anybody who goes back to it can find some of the publications. And what I'll speak about today is um, mostly published, but about 30% is still unpublished work. So what I hope to cover first, and excuse me if uh, my slides jump around, I'm trying to use a finger pointer. Um, I'll try to find the glycemic index and tell you about our hypothesis. I'll tell you a little bit about mechanisms in terms of defining what is glycation and glycative damage and how that relates to proteostasis compromise. 
Then I'll go into the human epidemiological data um, that supports the hypothesis. And then I'll tell you about work from some animal models in which we're trying to pursue the hypothesis and learn more about what's going on in the eyes of these animals with regard to the influence of diet. Um, then I'll come out of the talk, um, that part of the talk, uh, we'll, and tell you some information about drugs that we've tested. And then I'll talk about, uh, at the very end, the glu glove, that's the glucose lowering for vision extension, that's the human intervention trial, that we with, with which we hope to prove the hypothesis and show that it's really all applicable in humans. Um, if you see titles in red, that's because it's data from ours to be distinguished that other people's data that I'll quote. So what is the glycemic index? The glycemic index is a kinetic measure of the amount of glucose that's released into the bloodstream um, when you eat a food. So say you eat a teaspoon of sugar, 50 grams of sugar, it rapidly gives us cells a jolt of, 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 of sugar, and then that rapidly decreases and tails off. And one measures the area under the curve, say, in about two hours as a general measure of glycemic responses. And you could also use white bread, also gives you a pretty rapid jolt. On the other hand, if you eat whole grain foods, they release the same amount of carbohydrate eventually, or they may release the same amount of carbohydrate eventually, but it comes in at a much slower rate. So you can make an index of low or low glycemic index foods to high glycemic index foods and do an evaluation of the glucose responses. And one can do that for the whole diet, in fact, and I'll get back to that shortly, but here you have a diet that's replete with fish and fruits and vegetables or another diet that could be all fruits and vegetables, another one that's filled with junk food, ice creams, and et cetera. Um, and each of those can be categorized as a high or low glycemic index diet. And now we can actually quantify that. So as I like to begin my 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 tra trail um, way back. So here's Eve handing Adam a, an apple, and um, but sometimes if that apple hangs around, it gets brown, right? And then we wonder what can we put into our eyes to keep from this brown stuff happening if the brown stuff is damaging. Well, is the brown stuff damaging? Here we have cartilage from a young person going up to an old person. This is just interstitial cartilage. And you can note that it gets brown upon aging. If you look at the lenses of eyes of old people, where I'm pointing, again, those lenses oftentimes get very brown. And Vincent Monnier and his team actually quantified this appearance of this brown compounds. In this case, it's an advanced glycation end product, and I'll get to that in a minute. Here's one called oxymethylysine. And you could see, that the, le the levels of this stuff increase with, with um, geometric proportions as aging progresses. Alert, emergency personnel in vicinity of Raymond Avenue in Somerville. Avoid the area. Update to follow. It's, it's there. Gee, that's, that's what happens when you work in a dangerous neighborhood. Ups alert, <laughs> emergency personnel in vicinity of Raymond. Okay, it's not this neighborhood, so I'll keep going. <laughs> about that. Um, so if you look in retinas, there's also an accumulation of brown and yellow stuff. In fact, it's drusen. And we even grade AMD based on the appearance of drusen, right? There's big, small, soft, not soft, wet. Um, so again, it's this accumulation of this brown stuff that's a problem. And this, this is basically a summary in case I get cut off again of what's going on. And basically, uh, aging, there's a backup of this yellow stuff and systems fail, right? And that's going to be the theme of this talk. Oh, there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so proteins um, in cells, right, they see sugar when the sugar comes to them. And they form these shift bases. And uh, they may form these, what we will start calling advanced glycation end products. In this case, fructoselysine. And there's lots of them, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, one of the major culprits in terms of the glycation is methylglyoxal, which is released from sugars upon uh, metabolism. It's one of the major metabolic glycating uh, moieties in the body, and it's released both from sugars and also from fats. And so you can form these advanced glycation end products or advanced lipid end products. And methylglyoxal is the major glycating metabolite derived from glucose. And our thinking is that cells can't handle the challenge. 
By the way, is my voice coming through clear enough? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here's an example of another few advanced glycation end products being formed. Here's methylglyoxal. It's a dicarbonyl. It's very reactive. It finds meets lysine, in, which is part of a protein, forms carboxyethyl lysine within that protein. Or another option is to form this methylglyoxal dimer. And you can imagine it. This is one protein, and this is the other protein. Those are now being cross-linked. So small proteins can get to become very large and form cytotoxic aggregates. And I'll get back to that in a minute too. Uh, alternatively, methylglyoxal could find arginine and form argypyrimidine or hydroimidazolones, MGH1 we'll call it soon, or tetrahydropyrimidine. And there's a whole bunch of these things. And what I'm gonna propose to you, and if somebody was had a good garage and a mass spec, starting a business, identifying these things could be very lucrative. Um, so in addition to these damaging agents, there's also protective capacities, right? One of those protective capacities, the proteolytic machines, we'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, the antioxidants or anti-glycative enzyme system. So this cartoon diagrams the protective machineries in terms of the proteases. You have the ubiquitin-dependent um, proteolytic system on the left and the autophagic on the right. Here we have a protein that's in its native conformation. It has a degron, that's a, the code for come get me, I'm gonna, I wanna be degraded, um, but that's all hidden. If on, on the other hand, that, that protein gets exposed to oxidative stress or some other stress, or in this case, sugar stress gets glycated, the protein gets unwound, and all of a sudden you have these advanced glycation end products being recognized. The degron is recognized, it can become ubiquitinated, and once ubiquitinated in the functioning system, it could flow through the proteasome, that's the protease that degrades ubiquitinated proteins, and it spits out the components of the protein so that they can be recycled. We'll call that youth. On the other hand, if upon aging or upon extensive damage or stress, those proteins, the proteasome itself isn't recognized or the proteolytic machinery is dysfunctional, those proteins will become, <clears throat> excuse me, cross-linked and form cytotoxic aggregates. Now, there is a, another option, right? That is that um, P62, a protein which recognizes and serves as a link between the ubiquitin pathway and the lysosomal pathway, can bring proteins from that aren't degraded on time to the lysosome, and those can be degraded in a lysosomal apparatus. But that too can be compromised upon aging or upon glycative stress, again, leading to the accumulation of these cytotoxic aggregates. In fact, solid, a lot of times you just see these giant lysosomes accumulating in old stress cells. So this information I'm telling you is consistent with information that's been published over the last couple of decades about rapamycin, which rapamycin is an activator of autophagy. It's an inhibitor of mTOR, it's an activator of autophagy, and it's also been associated with extension of life. So how do I know that any of this is real? And I'm now summarizing uh, many people's years of work in our lab in just a couple of slides. Here we have an old, a young rat. And in that rat, we look for an agent, a mass glycation end product, in this case, MGH1, the hydroimidazolone. And you see, when we inject the brain of that rat with a proteasome inhibitor, nothing accumulates. If, on the other hand, we inject the brain of a 24-month-old rat, you do see the accumulation of these advanced glycation end products. So what does that mean? It means that either the proteolytic machinery is failing or there's more rapid accumulation of these advanced glycation end products. Um, but suffice to say that the combination of those two stresses is results in the accumulation of these advanced glycation end products in the older rat. Now, if you look in the RPE, of an animal that doesn't have P62, that can't bring damaged proteins to the autophagic machinery, you see accumulation in the RPE. You don't see that in the animal that's replete with P62. Now, if we do a trick, we take C. elegans and we expose the C. elegans to methylglyoxal, this glycating agent, in the absence of P62, we do see accumulation of these advanced glycation products in the absence and presence of P62, you don't. So in other words, this is telling us 
that one, the ubiquitin machinery may be functioning, but not functioning well enough. You do need the lysosome to partake. And when you have the, if you don't have the lysosome partaking, you start accumulating these vasoclication products. Now, do the reverse. Um, let's express, um, let, let, let's not express or exp over express, um, excuse me, yeah, over express P62. And here, when you over express P62, you see we could drain out those advanced glycation end products from the C elegans. So again, it shows you that you have two um, proteolytic pathways operating. They operate in concert with one another and both are protected. So the conclusion so far are that cells can't handle the bliss of sugar coming from high glycemic index diets or from methylglyoxal in this case. Um, proteins and other molecules will suffer glycative damage and become dysfunctional. And this will lead to accelerating cytotoxic accumulation of glycated moieties upon aging. So that begat the hypothesis that consuming high glycemic index diets will change metabolism, genetics, and microbiome with detrimental consequences on physiology. So, you know, before launching on this kind of exploration, you want to be sure that there's some validity or that at least the human epidemiological record supports it. So we began looking at Variety, variety of cohorts and asking the questions about relationships between diet and macular degeneration. <laughs> so in the first case, I think this is from the ARIDS data set. Um, we asked if people who consume the Oriental or Prudent diet, does the Mediterranean diet or the Middle Eastern diet, if they have these high intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, fish, and other seafood, do, are they protected? And what we found was looking at early AMD that those who subscribe to this diet, the more they subscribe to it, the more protected they are. Here you have about a 35% decreased risk. If you look at advanced AMD, you have even more decreased risk, about 60% decreased risk for those who subscribe to that kind of a diet. Now compare that with our diet in America, the Western diet, which is high intake of sugar, sweet beverages, processed products, fats, sucrose, refined grains, alcohol, etc. And you see the more one subscribes to that diet, the more the risk you have for AMD, early AMD or late AMD. In some cases, those risks are enormous, 50% increase, increase here, 2.7-fold 2, 2 increase there. So if you summarize, we weren't the only people who did this work, of course. There are plenty of studies available in the literature, and those are summarized here. Whether you talk about a prudent diet or a Mediterranean diet or a health, healthy eating index kind of diet, and those are described by lots of intakes of vegetables, um, legumes, fruits, um, fish, um, all of those show some protection against risk for AMD, whether you're talking about early AMD or late AMD or progression. Um, so actually, maybe not progression, but the, the, the earlier late. Um, if, on the other hand, you consume this high red meat diet, saturated fats, processed foods, sweets, de um, desserts, sugar-sweetened beverages, those are associated with greater risk for A and B. Okay. Now, let's talk about the glycemic index per se. Now, if you look at various um, cohorts, and I think we've done three or four cohorts now, and the Australians have done a couple of cohorts, and I think Emily Chu's group and Keenan um, has asked some comparable questions. Those people who consume high glycemic index diets all have increased, in, in all those studies, there's the unanimity of that. <clears throat> all those studies show there's an increased risk for AMD. Now, the reason this is circled here, um, albeit a low increased risk, um, it has consequences, and we'll get back to that later. But this is circled because we're talking about progression of AMD. So we've even found that you, the progression of AMD, at least ep using epidemiological data, is, is delayed. Now, mind you, at this point, we're not talking about intervention trials. We're talking about epidemiology. And these risks are comparable. Some of these risks are comparable to risk incurred by smoking um, or even by genetics. So it's, it's non-trivial. This is rather remarkable to my mind. Um, yeah. So interestingly, these risks are also increased for those who consume high glycemic index diets 
but the risks for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, diabetes-related cancer, and all-cause mortality. So again, there seems to be multiple benefits one gets from consuming these, what I'll now call healthier diets. And this paper just came out two weeks ago, which says the exposure to sugar um, in the first thousand days of life, that's the first three years of life. In fact, it actually begins at conception, so it's the first two years of life plus in, in the utero. Um, that those, those kids who didn't have sugar in their first days of life, later on in life, when they were 50 years of age, had less susceptibility to diabetes and hypertension. That's a very interesting article, just came out um, in Science a couple of weeks ago. Um, so in other words, it's never too early to begin. Um, so now what can we learn from experiments? So first I'll tell you about a wild type C57, then I'm gonna tell you about a couple of other kinds of animal groups that we worked with. So if you take a mouse and age it to 12 months, let's say about a middle-aged mouse, um, and then bring it up to 24 months, but at that point you change its diet, from 12 months you change its diet to either a low glycemic index diet or a high glycemic index diet. The only thing that's changing here is the carbohydrate. In one case, we're feeding 70% amylose and 30% amylopectin. In the other case, the high glycemic index diet, we're feeding 100% amylopectin, which is a rapidly degraded starch. So everything else about these diets is identical, the vitamin mix, the mineral mix, the rooms they're in, et cetera. Um, then we have another group in which we switched over from a high glycemic index diet to a low glycemic index diet at 18 months. And we want to see if we could either avoid further damage or reverse damage or stabilize the animal. So here's weight gain. If they consume the low, the low glycemic index diet, by the way, the, based on bomb calorimetry, these diets are isocaloric. So the only thing that is different about them is the rate at which the food's getting into the animal, if, if it's getting into the animal. So here, the low glycemic index animal is not gaining all that much weight. The high glycemic index animal is gaining a lot of weight. But if you switch them over, the weights decline, although they never go back down to the low glycemic index value. So the weight gain is due to increased fat. I don't have time to show you that data. And the high, high glycemic index mice become glucose intolerant, but not diabetic. Excuse me. Um, so they, and they have higher plasma fasting insulin levels. So if you look at survival in these animals, you can see that the low glycemic index animal tend to live a little bit longer, at least based on this initial data. And this recalls data we, we published years ago about calorie restriction, where we actually restricted the calories um, rather than just changing the nature of the calories. Um, as we <laughs> So now what if you look in the retinas of these animals? Here's the photoreceptor layers, the low glycemic index fed animal, the high glycemic, glycemic index fed animal, and you can see these are quite different one from the other. You see a loss of photoreceptors. And the crossover group, interestingly enough, it doesn't show that damage. So either it stabilized the damage before the damage happened, or it's reverting, which is quite intriguing. Now, if we create an index based on retinal damage score. So the more the damage, the higher the score. And in, in some cases, I'll use the score. In some cases, I won't. So you have to be on your toes about this. Um, if we compare the high glycemic of this fat animal to the crossover and the low, in both cases of the low and the crossover, they have lower values, showing that they have preserved photoreceptor integrity compared to the high glycemic of fat animal. And these are quite statistically significant. So the crossover either delays or reverses the photoreceptor loss. So now let's look at additional phenomena or phenotypes in these animals. Here's the low glycemic fed animal, crossover and high. And in the first two, you see you have um, basal infolding still surviving, but in the high, you see those are replaced by laminar deposits. You see more lipofusin, you see more vacuoles, you see more lipids all in the high, see more atrophy, and I'll show you a few more phenotypes later. Now let's get to a little bit more of the, what I call the biochemistry, but it's more physiology, I guess. If you now ask the question about the advanced glycation end products, we're remembering that one of our focuses is the glycative damage specifically. If you look 
on, in the aged lens, as I showed you the brunescence before, that aged lens is accumulating these advanced glycation end products at a greater rate than, than the young, 22-year-old versus a 26-year-old human lens. If you look in the mouse brain, here's a 22-month-old versus a three-month-old, and you see much more accumulation of the advanced glycation end products. So it's an age-related phenomenon, right, regardless of what is causing the phenomenon. Now let's talk about the diet. Here the animals are the exact same age. I think these are 24 month old animals if I remember correctly. And you compare high glycemic, oops, sorry, high glycemic index and to low, high to low, high to low and high to low. In all cases, whether you're talking about the retina, the liver, the lens of the brain, in all cases, the high glycemic fit animal has higher levels of advanced glycation end products. See, it's threefold higher in the retina going up to 33-fold higher in the brain. If you look throughout the retina, using now immunohistochemical approaches for MGH1, this methylglaxyl hydrogen or the carboxyethyl arginine, you see that in a high glycemic fed animal, you have higher levels of these advanced glycation products throughout the retinas. And the crossover, on the other hand, is protected. And we see the same thing with advanced lipid end products, and I don't have time to go over that. But a lot of this has been published. Now, if we look at specific advanced glycation end products, call it glucose pain or carboxyethylysine or uh, 3-deoxyglucosone. In all cases, the high glycemic index fed animal in the plasmas have higher levels of these <laughs> glycated proteins. And you can even use this um, almost like a molecular clock. Or, or molecular clock of damage, that assessment of damage, we can plot glucose pain versus the amount of retina damage and see that this increases. As damage increases, the amount of glucose pain increases. And the same thing, by the way, for methylglaxyl, hydronamidazolone, and pentosidine, and pentosidine. So we have a lot of these potential biomarkers I'm trying to call to your attention. Um, now, what about lipids? We anticipated that there'd be a change in metabolism in these animals, and sure enough, we see that, that that's the case, and we'll move toward lipids as I go through this data. Here's C3-carnitine. It's, it's higher in the animals that are not affected by retinal damage. It's lower in the animals that are affected. The reverse of that is true for, for C22-6 cholesterol esters, lower in the animals that are not affected higher in the animals that are affected. And it's interesting because carnitines are inversely related to cholesterol levels. Um, looking at um, total cholesterol, LDL or HDL, higher in the high glycemic fed animal versus the low glycemic fed animal. And we also see more phosphatidylcholines and less triglycerides in the high glycemic index fed animals. This is in plasma. Now, we also did some transcriptomic analyses and I have very little data. I, I can't show you very much of that data. Some of it's published. Most of it has not been yet. Um, but you can see the dramatic differences in the high versus the low glycemic index fit animals. There's higher expression of 259 genes, low expression of 138 genes. And you could just look at a couple of those. These are exemplary, ELOVL5 or SREB1. These are all re related to long-chain fat production or sterile regulate, regulatory element binding, cholesterol and fatty acid biosynthesis, higher in the high glycemic index fed animal, lower in the low glycemic index fed animal. And the reverse is true for the enzymes that are associated with glycolysis. And we also looked at the microbiome. And what I want to call out to you here is the similarity of the microbiome of the, the crossover animal to the low. And um, in this case, it's for firmicutes. And in, in this case, it's unassigned at bacteria, bacteria unidentified as yet. You could see that the high glycemic fed animal has much higher levels of these than the low or the crossover. Remember, so in other words, it shows you how mutable these um, phenomena are, the, the microbiota are. Um, so we put together a network analysis, and this was published in Sheldon's paper in PNAS in 2017, and to, to try to understand what are the big actors here. Here you see um, 22.6 LPE being re re linearly related, in fact, to retinal damage. The more of that, the more the retinal damage. 
um, specific microbiota have been identified that seem to be particularly important. And Sheldon's doing a lot of work on that. And to my mind, something's very interested, interesting is serotonin. Is the higher the serotonin level, the lower the retinal damage. Again, you just plot these out on the line. Um, now, that's interesting to me because serotonin is actually a microbiota product, a primarily microbiota product, and it interacts with multiple um, these OTUs, the microbiota. And I'll, and I'll quote a reference, next slide. It's also related to, to proteostatic machinery. Um, so why the serotonin, reiterating why serotonin is interesting to me, higher serotonin is related to lower retinal damage scores, and it gives you good mood too. And consistent with Emily Chu's recent data from Arvo last year, um, and also with work from Panessi and Romano and Chris's labs showing that serotonin is protective against retinopathy. Um, and serotonin enhances proteolytic editing in a cell non-autonomous way. This is very interesting to me. There's almost no literature about it, but I think it could be a gold mine because you can enhance organismic prote proteostasis and health span. I'm proposing that that's the case, um, if this is really true. Um, and serotonin is also decreased in hepatocarcinoma. So there's many reasons why you think about uh, have an interest in serotonin. But of course, uh, there may be some cautions in terms of causing vasoconstriction. So the conclusions from this data are that there's a diet glut, a gut, excuse me, a diet gut retina interaction axis. Um, the low glycemic index diet protects against many features of early AMD seen in high glycemic index diets. The crossovers maintain protection of the low glycemic index diet. The high glycemic index diet causes a more lipophilic metabolome. Switching diets alters microbiomes. And multiple advanced glycation end products, serotonin, uh, lysotidyl, phosphatidyl, ethanolamines, uh, phosphatidylcholines, may offer unprecedented opportunities for diagnosis, prognosis, and testing new therapies. So now, moving on to the um, animal, mo other animal models. So we tested two of those. I'll talk about two at least. Um, we have many more. Um, one involves overexpressing glyoxylase. Um, we ex glyoxylase alters methylglyoxal, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, diminishes it. We anticipate that overexpression of glyoxylase will decrease advanced glycation and products and damage. And just to document, um, I, again, I don't have time to show you this data, but the glyoxylase activity was two to three-fold higher in eye tissues in our animals. And these animals were given to us by a Dr. Palmer from UC San Diego. On the other hand, knocking out NRF2, which regulates a lot of antioxidant responses, we anticipate that would increase glycative damage and oxidative damage and glycative damage and would increase damage and physiological damage. Ups alert, urgent oh, update. Oh Active fire at 74 Raymond Avenue, Summer. Sorry, that's the other campus of Tufts. They'll have to suffer. Um, so um, methylglyoxal, as I said before, is a very uh, active, reactive uh, derivative of glucose. But in the presence of, of glyoxylase, excuse me, oops, sorry, um, glyoxylase 1 and glyoxylase 2, that gets converted to lactate, which is a less glycating agent. Now, it's important to realize, although I'm going to ignore this for the rest of the talk, that genetic material is also modified by the same reactions. Um, so if we now look in the retinas of these animals, here's the high, gly high glycemic index fed animal, low glycemic fed control animals. And in the glyoxylase overexpressors, notice that in the high glycemic index fed animal, as compared with what I showed you with the controls here, um, the animal that has extra glyoxylase expressed is protected, okay? And the, we, and also, of course, the glyoxylase overexpressed on the low glycemic index diet is also protected. So now I'm plotting not damage score, but just the actual adenuclear layer thicknesses. And you can see that these three groups, the low glycemic index fed, the, gly the glyoxylase overexpressor, even fed a high glycemic index diet and the glyoxylase overexpressed in a low glycemic index diet 
all show protection as compared with the high glycemic index fed animal. Now I'll just select a few data out of this busy slide. Here we're asking about advanced glycation and products in collagen, plasma, or a lens. We actually took on these animals all apart and asked about the advanced glycation and products in various tissues. And here I'll just call to your attention the fact that the three groups I mentioned last, the glycolase fed animal and high glycemic, glycemic index animal, the low glycemic control, the low glycemic <laughs> lax, lysorb expressive, all have lower MGH1 in their tail collagen lower carboxyethylysine in plasma, lower furosine in lens. Um, and on the other hand, and it's important for you to appreciate this, that these, these, these responses are to some extent tissue dependent um, and, and maybe dependent on a variety of other things that we may not understand. Here's a low glycemic fed animal and a low glycemic fed animal that has oxalis overexpressed. And these are both lower then both high glycemic fed animal, be it the control or the glycemic overexpressive. So in this case, the overexpressive isn't saving us from the fructose lysine. Okay, so that's different. So different glycation and products may have different responses. Um, but we found many of them and mo many of these could end up being biomarkers. So the conclusions from this part are that advanced glycation on products accumulate in high glycemic and next fed animals. The glow, glyoxylase um, overexpression aids in removal of most advanced glycation on products in some tissues, many tissues, and delays features of AMD, and metabolism is altered due to diet and to the glyoxylase expression. So what about the NRF2? Um, the, we, we, NRF2, right, together with the response element could trigger the expression of glaxolase itself. So that's interesting based on what I just told you, where it triggers antioxidant responses, anti-inflammatory responses, autophagic responses, and many metabolism genes. So this work was done on NRF2 animals by Scott and Jim Handa, Scott Flaf Flafker and Jim Handa before maybe others as well. Um, so we use this same model, a comparable model, and I'm uh, point out to you that the weight gain was similar, surprisingly to me, uh, to the weight gain in the high glycemic or low glycemic fed control animals. Um, the NRF2 though, they die at younger ages than the wild type. So all the phenomena I'm gonna show you happened six months earlier in the NRF2 um, deprived animal. And here's the retinas of the wild type control on a um, low glycemic index diet. Um, here's the NRF2 low glycemic index comparable to that. And the NRF2 high glycemic and knockout high glycemic fed animal doesn't benefit, right? It has less, um, less photoreceptors. And if you plot damage here, you have less damage in the wild type fed low glycemic fed animal, more damage as I've showed you before in the high glycemic, glycemic index fed animal control. If you compare that with the NRF2 null animals, to see the same relationship, low glycemic index fed and high glycemic fed. But what you see is the low glycemic index fed at null is more comparable to the wild type high. So this happens at much earlier ages, as I said. If you look for other phenomena in these animals, you can see lipofusion accumulating in the high glycemic fed animal. This is the NRF2s, um, swollen mitochondria, basal lamina deposits, replacing the infoldings, um, see hypopigmentation, hyperpigmentation, and even some infiltrating cells. And we can even plot um, lipofusin, appearance of lipofusin versus retinal damage score in these animals too. So again, these animals are a powerful model, I, I think, for ex exploring many aspects of AMD or AMD-related features, if you call it that. Um, so they also, they said they have lipid fuel deposits within Brooks membrane, loss of cardiac capillaris, macrophage infiltration, and in, increased autofluorescence. Um, now, what about the advanced glycation end products? If we look at MGH1, pentosidine, and fructose lysine, these are in plasma, you see higher levels of these advanced glycation end products. Now, what am I comparing here? This is just high glycemic index fed versus high glycemic index fed. This is the NRF2 knockout. 
it has higher levels of the advanced glycation end product in this knockout using the same diet versus the one. Now here we're comparing only diet, same age animal. In the NRF2 knockout, low versus high, and you see the knockout incurs greater age-related, age-related damage. That means advanced glycation end product. Same thing for fructosyl lysine. If you look at carboxyethylarginine, um, you see more accumulating in the high glycemic expected animal, the NRF2 knockout. If you look for glucose pain, again, you see more accumulation in the high glycemic expected animal versus the low glycemic expected animal. Um, again, we did transcriptomics, and you see these genes upregulated, non upregulated. And the upregulated in the wild type, um, they see genes that are upregulated in the wild type that are not upregulated in the end of two knockouts. And you see genes that are downregulated in the wild type that are not downregulated in the NRF2. And one of the ones that is, interests me, of course, is M mTOR um, uh, because that has to do with the autophagy responses as well. And of course, GSTM shows you that the genotype makes a big difference. You see in the, um, the NRF2 knockouts, you just don't see those same kind of responses as we get with the wild type animals. We did a lot of metabolomics on these animals as well. And what you can see here is that be it the cat animal or the wild type animal, in both cases, we have um, dysregulation of the lipid layers, um, which is indicates uh, this indi indicative of hepatic disease, be it the wild, both in the wild type as well as in the NRF2 knockout. Remembering the NRF2 knockout is showing everything six months earlier. Um, and also, there may be inflammatory responses indicated in the NRF2 knockouts, where you see altered ratios of the omega-3 to omega-6 animals. Excuse me, and, and omega-3 to omega-6 um, fats. <clears throat> we, again, we looked at the microbiomes um, in these animals, and what you see here is that um, lower lower levels of certain bacterioidae, bacterioidaceae in the wild type, low glycemic index versus the high glycemic index fed animals. Um, so you have um, the yeah, lower levels in the wild type, lower, I, did I, I think I would label this backwards, excuse me. Um, the lower levels in the high versus the low, excuse me. Um, and in the NRF2 knockout animals, you see lower levels in the high versus the low as well. If on the other hand, you compare the NRF2 knockouts, um, they both, you, you lose bacteria, bacteria these, these micro, micro, microbes um, relative to the wild types. Um, so in the highs, it's very interesting. So these are all altered. Um, so the conclusions from this NRF2 knockout animals, and I have a lot of conclusions, many of which, from many of them, I didn't show you some data, as the long-term consumption of the high glycemic index diets in the NRF2 knockout mice leads to obesity, hyperglycemia, and glucose intolerance. The NRF2 knockout mice develop retinopathy earlier. It's exacerbated by consumption of the high glycemic index diet. The NRF2 um, high glycemic Mice develop multiple, sometimes advanced features of atrophic AMD. Um, the NRF2 is necessary for mice to respond to glycemic induced stress. I'm going to skip over some of those others. Um, low glycemic index diet preserves antioxidant capacities, coupled with poor phenotype, the inability to confront glycative stress or remove glycated moieties corroborates that glycative stress is etiologic for early AMD phenotypes in high glycemic against fed animals. There are also NRF2 independent phenomena. I didn't stress that. The NRF2 knockout mice develop a broad range of cataracts at high frequency. And that's a very useful model as well. But that's been published a couple of years ago by our group. Um, the mice fed the low glycemic index that have low glycemic index animal diets um, have higher levels of citric acid cycle intermediates um, and the pathways that can exploit NRF2 or its functionality represent promising interventional targets to treat age-related diseases where function of NRF2 diminishes with age and oxidative stress. 
So finally, let's move on to the last two parts. Um, actually, one. Um, so we thought, given this, we asked what drugs that limit glucose can be salutary. So we tried three drugs, a carbosempagliflozin and phenylfibrin. The important, I think the more, most important two here are a carbos and empagliflozin. A carbos inhibits um, alpha amylase and it turns a high glycemic index diet into a low glycemic index diet because it prevents the breakdown of simple carbohydrates. Empagliflozin inhibits the resorption of, of sugar, so it reduces glucose uptake. Um, so if we look at body weights, um, you see the drugs cause differential body weights. As you can imagine, low glycemic index diet, the high, the high, high glycemic index, high glycemic index fed a carbohydrate, a carbos treated, and empagliflozin treated animals have lower body weights, and even the phenol fibrate shows lower body weight than the high glycemic. Index. If you look at the retina phenotypes, let's just look at the bottom here, and now we're talking about preservation of photoreceptors. Of course, the low glycemic index fed animal has higher preservation, as does the acarbose fed animal, and to some extent, the empagliflozin, but less so, not so, the phenylfibrate fed animal. So these are three drugs that work with different mechanisms, one of which really addresses directly our, our hypothesis and it supports the hypothesis. Um, and I'm not showing you this data, but pigmentation and vacuolation are also protected by acarbose and empagliflozin. So if we look at um, the metabolomes of these animals, you could see that when we look at the metabolome, we might have expected this, that the acarbose treated high glycemic fed animal is comparable to a low glycemic fed animal. And those are sem similar but different from the empagliflozin fed animal, but different from the high glycemic fed and the phenylfibrate treated at high glycemic index fed animal. Um, carnitine stands out as a very right biomarker, if you will, of the carbose treated animal and the low glycemic fed animal diet. Um, similarly, if we look at various advanced glycation end products, I'll only show you one, is MGH1. Here's the high glycemic fed animal, um, and pale collagen, and it's higher than the low glycemic index fed or the drug treated animals. Um, I'm going to skip that. Oh, oh. Well covered. Okay, we and if you look at the reverse, the um, the, the the lipid levels um, are higher in the uh, 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 are lower in the acarbose fed animal as as they are in the low glycemic index fed animal, and the phenylfibrate and empagliflozin have intermediate effects compared to the high glycemic fed animal. And this is maybe anticipates some of the data that got uh, that's been published or comparable to the metformin data. Um, which Skandra just published, talking about age-related macular degeneration in pa patients without diabetes, um, showing some protection. And Yang showed comparable or analogous data in male monkeys. And there's another paper that talks about stimulation of AMPK due to um, form, um, prevents degeneration of photoreceptors in the RPE. Um, so now closing out, um, what's the problem with our dietary pyramids as we all get used to, we've all gotten used to looking at these over the last few years? What should be on my plate? Um, so just to show you um, what we are consuming, um, here's the typical Snapple, it's nine teaspoons of sugar, uh, uh, Starbucks, 13 teaspoons of sugar, our favorite drink, Coke, 16 teaspoons of sugar, this is just per per serving, and uh, Gatorade, eight point five teaspoons of sugar. So, if you ask yourself, what is the not the recommended amount of sugar for children? It should be zero from zero to two years of age. It should be zero sugar, which corresponds to that slide I showed you about this new science paper. Um, and the dietary guidelines for adults. It depends on whose guidelines, but. They're a little bit more lenient here. It says we should have about 12 teaspoons of sugar for the whole day. So one of these drinks is basically exceeding your limit for the day. Um, so in addition to the IRED's vitamins, what should we do? So how much do you think we need to reduce the glycemic index to enjoy the benefits? And that's a question to the audience. 
Just yell anything before the fire alarm goes off again here. <laughs> hey, I think swapping pasta from regular to full grain may help a little bit, maybe. Right. Okay, but how much is the index? So anyway, I'll get get away before the police throw me out of my office. Um, to enjoy the benefits of lower glycemic index diets with respect to eye disease, one need to reduce the glycemic index by only six units. So how much is six units? If you change from the equivalent of only what five slices of white white bread to five slices of whole grain bread, this is talking about for the whole diet. So it need not only be white bread. You could be taking out one of those cooks. Um, you could go from a high glycemic, low glycemic index diet to a higher glycemic index diet and gain the benefit of, of, of that conversion. And here's where that um, attributable attributable uh, cal response calculation comes in, attributable risk calculation comes in that was quoted in the introduction. Um, it says, if one does that, we predict that you could save 100,000 people from AMD in five years. So the re return on this kind of investment is enormous. And yet it's such a simple thing to do, one thinks. Um, now, in terms of fiber, you should be eating 30 grams per day, but most get less than 20 grams per day. Virgin olive oil supposedly has more polyphenol, so one could get that if you can afford it. Um, so the conclusions are that human epidemiological literature indicates that consuming high glycemic index diets is related to increased risk for, for progression of AMD, as well as for CVD diabetes and some cancers. The animal and some human studies indicate that in consumers of high glycemic index diets, the etiology of AMD, like aging per se, involves accumulation of cytotoxic and dysfunctional advanced glycation and product-modified proteins, which is due to compromised function of age, enzymes and genetic materials and organs, and specifically the ubiquitin and autophagic pathways, antioxidant enzyme systems, of which I list here, and the animals provide new models for AMD research, biomarkers for diagnosis, prognosis, and new farmer options. The high glycemic index diet alter metabolomes, microbiomes, and genetics, favoring more lipids and lipid synthesis and inflammation. And there are interactions between all these. Um, different tissues respond differently to diets. There are gene-dependent and independent effects of dietary glycemic index on the advanced glycation end products. Drug studies corroborate these observations. And the work indicates that diminishing dietary glycemic index and glycative damage are readily achievable. Modifiable risk factors of early AMD features in mice and maybe humans. And I say, let's glove. That is getting on to the glucose lowering for vision extension study that I'm uh, participating in with the dream team of investigators. Um, Michael Gore and Susan Roberts and Emmy Hartnett and a whole bunch of other people who are really very, very important participants in this study. Um, so I'll close with this. Um, I contrasted with that study. First slide I showed you from the science paper. Um, yeah, so thanks for your attention and your time. And I'm sorry if I ran late. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions from the Zoom. So the first question, uh, Goldis, are you there? Can you ask your question? I can try, as long as there's no fire or bomb. <laughs> Sure. Um, hi, Alan. That was fantastic. I was just curious because the changes that you showed in the choroid and the various animal models that were fed the high glycemic diet, that, it was striking. And it actually looked like it was not, not I mean, it may have affected the choroid capillaries because I noted that you said that in the slide, but it could also be the outer um, choroidal layers. And I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to look at the sequence of degeneration does it occur in the retina RP first and then the choroid, or does it all happen at the same time? Where do you think is more? Um, it's, it's a really important question. Um, but, you know, we only have really most of these studies, we only have two time points. It's either 18 months or, or 18 months for the wild type animals or 24 months for the wild type animals. In 18 months, they really didn't show that much damage. So we're sort of blind, I'm afraid. And in the NRF2s, um, those animals, um, we killed them at 18 months or, or they would have died. So we again, we only had really one time point. 
So I'm not, I don't think I can answer the question. Sheldon, are you on the line? Maybe Sheldon could talk a little bit more about it, but I'm not sure. Hi, Goldas. Um, yeah, you have a really good eye for <laughs> the histology. Um, we've tried to look at this in a few limited um, time points. When we looked at 10 months, we didn't see any notable changes. Um, the, the, even the changes in the RPE were really subtle and definitely not in the retina. Um, at 18 months in wild type mice, I think we did not see choroidal changes, but we did see some RPE changes. Um, but I don't know kind of exactly what's the chicken and what's the egg. I think a lot of us would like to know, and I think we could probably use some good longitudinal and vivo imaging to get the answer to that. Um, I definitely think there's a lot going on in the choroid that we haven't explored yet. Okay. All right, let's move to the next question. Michael Corey, do you have a question or comment? Uh, no, I have a question, actually. <clears throat> it was a really great talk, Alan. But uh, one of the things you showed was that pharmacologic manipulations could replicate aspects of modifying the metabolome and the biology to match that of the low glycemic diet. And realistically, particularly in an American society, which is much more willing to take pills or supplements or something else rather than modifying the diet, why would you not want to explore a pharmacologic approach um, to essentially replicate a low glycemic diet rather than the real greater challenge of trying to actually get people to adhere to one? Well, as the person who's heading up our glove study, that's not a nice question. Um, but uh, no, but uh, I think of course it's, it, it's a useful thing to do. And in fact, people are doing it, right? People are, are trying to use metformin to achieve the same thing. And, you know, a carbose is a drug that not a lot of people like um, because it makes you uncomfortable. Um, so I, I think it would be a great thing to do. And in fact, I think we should actually go back and explore. There's many, you know, databases now in which we could, might be able to ask the question of whether people who took a carbose maybe for diabetes or other reasons, um, in fact, are protected against AMD. Well, it's interesting that your carbose, by the way, is more heavily used in China than it is yeah. in Europe and the United States. Right. So there, there's probably data from there. Yeah. All right, let's move to questions uh, here. And we have so many, so let's just start uh, from Andrew. Hi, great. This is Andrew Brown uh, from UC Irvine. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed your talk. Kind of uh, piggybacking off some of the ideas that Dr. Gordon just mentioned. Uh, I really like that you lead with trying to change diet. And um, as someone who sees patients, I know that I agree with Dr. Gordon that very rarely will patients be willing to change diet in California and back in the Midwest where I'm from, it was even harder. So um, when you provide systemic medications, metformin or a carbose, that's one approach. And now we're in this era of talking about gene therapy. Do you think there are approaches where one could um, modify the absorption in the intestinal endothelium or uh, epithelium to, uh, to modify the absorption of, of really any kind of uh, sugar? Hey. Um, well, I, I didn't, I failed to mention that people like Maria Grant are, are asking questions about the like, barrier function and certainly preserved barrier function is one way to improve, you know, the physiology. Um, so conditions that can be avoided that compromise barrier function are certainly worth pursuing. Whether or not, may, now maybe one could modify the microbiome in a way. To, to to accomplish what you're suggesting. I, I don't know if you were talking about modifying the genes of the, the, the recipient, the person or, or the microbiome, but it's plausible one could do it's plausible that one could utilize or exploit the microbiome to that end. Am I answering your question? I hope I'm yeah. answering your question. Yes, thank you. Hi, Dr. Taylor. This is Emily from uh, Dorotis Grosser Craftics Lab. Um, I noticed in the data in, in mice, 
on the high high glycemic index uh, diet, there was an accumulation of advanced secretion end products in four different tissues, which showed a range from three to 33 fold accumulation. Um, so I think in the retina it was three fold, but in the brain it was up to 33. Um, what do you think accounts for the differences in this wide uh, range of uh, accumulation? Yeah, so, so I, I don't know. The, the honest answer is I don't know, but I'm really curious about it. And, and I'm even more curious than is implied because I'm so interested in the fact that so many different tissues and different diseases respond similarly to this simple modification. You know, whether it's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or, or various cancers, if that's true. Um, and all of that's, you know, supported by human data. Um, but the, the, the honest answer is I don't know, but it's something I, 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 I was telling somebody before, maybe Tim, who's coordinating this whole thing today, that, um, that, that, that I wish I had another career, you know, to start all over again, <laughs> because it's so, it would be so much fun to find that out. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Taylor, wonderful presentation. This is uh, Derek from Chris's lab. Uh, and I just had a question about the crossover diet. I was really impressed by how much of a difference the late crossover diet made after you introduced that kind of first 1,000 days study in humans. Um, I was just curious, is that just come down to behavior changes are very difficult, or is there any other kind of explanation that you might have online? Well, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Certainly, as you just heard from the questions to people before you, Behavior change is difficult to do, and that, that's exactly what the GLOVE study we're doing now is, is to see if we can convince people to change their diet, that is, people who already know they have some indications of AMD. So we're trying to figure that out um, in, in an American cohort, in fact, in an American cohort in L.A. Um, but I, I, did I miss your question? No, it was it was... Basically, if is it really just come down to the behavior change is difficult? Is is the question? I mean, it sounds like it is. Yeah. Well, the, you know, when the first time I submitted this grant proposal, everybody loved it, but they said to me, "Great idea." Except, how are you going to get people to change their diet? <laughs> so the answer is, I don't know, and we'll try figure out if we can encourage them to change their diet. Um, I, I mean, if it was me, I would. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know the answer. Okay, we have another question from the Zoom. Hiren, are you there? I am. Hey, uh, hi, yeah. Uh, my name is Hiren. Um, I just want to know what are the other contributing factors apart from the diet which can lead to the disease progressions? Like there are n number of contributing factors. So um, could you highlight some of those things which are also the contributing factors for this kind of disease study? Well, one thing that I hope I didn't, that didn't go unnoticed is, you know, my passion or interest in the pro proteostasis machinery. So clearly this proteostasis machinery that, that we already know is compromised <laughs> upon aging. So, you know, that a lot of the antioxidant responses are, are, are compromised upon aging. And all those, I, I didn't mean to imply that you know, sugar is the only problem of this disease. And clearly, it's a multifactorial disease. And I'm just talking about one aspect of it, but there are so many available um, physiological responses that one could consider, everything from barrier function to the microbiota to, to, to the diet, to the proteostasis machinery, et cetera, that, that are involved. Okay. And another question from, um, from the Zoom, Jenny. We cannot hear you. Ginny, we cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, so I'm doing you your problem. Your question. Uh, hi, Dr. Taylor. This is Josh from Dr. Richard Snap. Um, uh, it's great work um, that uh, we know that ubiquitin dependent proteolysis is in, limited in aged mice. Another theory for uh, aging is the uh, altered uh, epigenetic profiling, for example, increased methylation. So I'm very curious if you look at the uh, uh, epigenetic recognitions for the genes that are associated with ubiquitin-dependent proteolysis. 
Um, I think it's a great idea. And, that, and I tried to stress that in that one slide where I talked about glycative damage to proteins, but noted that it's also dam damaging genetic materials. And I hope so. I, I have not done that. And I actually did a literature search on that. And there's not that much on it. So I think it's a golden opportunity for somebody. Hi, Dr. Taylor. This is Vladimir Kefalov here in the audience at UC Irvine. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, Mark Penesi published a paper a few years ago showing that uh, ketogenic and low protein diet can be protective in mice uh, models of retinitis pigmentosa. So can you comment on whether the mechanism of protection in those mice, Mike, how, we, how it is related to your studies with low uh, and high glucose? And more broadly speaking, do you think that the metabolic modulation of AMD is similar or different from possible metabolic modulation in inherited retinal diseases? Um, so the answer is both yes and no. Um, and, and the yes part is, I think, with a ketogenic diet, right, to the extent to which you're diminishing sugar burdens, then you might sustain less sugar-based damage. Now, that's not to say you don't incur more lipid-based damage. So one would have to know more about like the, met the metabolome in those animals to make a really clear, intelligent response to your question. But theoretically, um, one could diminish the, the, the sugar-based damage. Um, now, the other part of your question, I just forgot what it was. Uh, whether metabolic modulation of oh, yeah. And, yeah, of course. So, of course, metabolic modulation is going to be important. Now, how, how that metabolism... But the, metabol the metabolic alteration could be different in different people in different situations, right? So, I mean, it, it's never independent. We're never independent of the metabolism, but the metabolism may be altered in so many different ways and depending on, you know, whose APOE mutation you have or you don't have or, or, or how your diet even epigenetically changed your responses. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a, an important question probably very complicated to answer. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm a researcher at Dr. Palchowski's lab. Um, and I had a question on some reading I've done in the past about uh, the two bacteria lines that were studied on mice that um, are related to GI issues, uh, Firmicutes and Bacteroides. Is there any study relating on how um, like regulation of the two bacteria strains in the gut can relate to the eye? Um, so yes, there is. And in fact, we've done a good bit of work to pursue that. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Sheldon. If you could put Sheldon on, he's, he's much better at this. He's, he's really the expert on this. Could, yeah, hi, thanks. Could, could, you, could you put Sheldon on? Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm on. Um, it's a really interesting question. I, I think it's just important to realize within each of those phyla, there are like tons of taxa. Um, it, so it's hard to kind of like summarize like all of the bacteria within those phyla having similar effects together. I think um, what the human studies and the mouse studies have shown is that there probably are some taxa and some of them are members of Firmicutes and some of them are members of Bacteroidetes um, that contribute. Um, the idea that the ratio of the two is a factor in obesity, I think, has been disproven. Um, so it just comes down to kind of understanding like what the different taxa are, and, and each microbiome is a little distinct. Um, so, so it's it's a more complicated question than the one you're asking, but I think like there are clear associations within both of those phyla. Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, my name is Zach, I'm also from the Palczewski lab. And I was kind of curious if anyone's done work with like notobiotic mice, uh, where the microbiome is very limited or completely eliminated, um, and whether you compared like a low glycemic index versus high glycemic index diet in those animals to kind of parse out the contributions of microbiota. Okay, Sheldon, <clears throat> Sheldon go for it. This is your chance. <laughs> Um, actually, um, Dimitra Scantra would be the right person to answer that one. I, it's really hard to feed mice those kinds of diets for a long term um, in a notobiotic condition. Um, so we haven't gone on to even think about trying those. Um, 
what we've done is we've tried to play around with antibiotics to deplete out specific kinds of taxa, or we've done like fecal microbiota transplants to do mm -hmm. them, um, which are kind of more doable experiments, but maybe less convincing than doing them in germ-free mice. So um, I would I would love to do those because I do think like that you need the effects of the gut microbiota to mediate some of those protective effects of the low glycemic index diet. Right, right. Thank you. Now, what, one caution that I would make, and again, you can all correct me if I'm wrong about this, but you could take the exact same animal with the exact same diet and put it in two different rooms, and it's not always the case that they'll have the exact same complement of microbiota. So one has to be cautious with these experiments, you know, as with all. Hello, Dr. Taylor. My name is Hernan, and I'm a graduate student under Dr. Palczewski. Uh, my question was, how would the risk of AMD be affected for people who consume a high glycemic diet as part of their lifestyle, either because they are a high-performance athlete or their job requires heavy lifting or strenuous exercise? Wow. Um, I, you know, the... the uh, I think that if you burn up a certain amount of sugar that you just need it for your ATP, that's another way to get rid of sugar, you know? So I, I'm guessing now. I, the answer, the honest answer is I don't know. But I'm just going to wave my hands here a little bit and, and say that I think if you're really burning a lot of the energy quickly and you're not, eat, you know, you're not going into a lipid profile and all the other things that are adverse effectors, physiology, then I think you'd be somewhat protected, um, more protected than if you just were a couch potato. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is in, this was very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about uh, some of the data you presented. Uh, you're showing the, you know, uh, you mentioned about it, the degradation pathways are very critical. Uh, have you explored, and you show some data with P62 overexpression, uh, have you explored whether in this, you know, just uh, these uh, high glycation food, or is it the failure of the system to degrade that, uh, or both of them are responsible for, you know, increasing the risk for the diseases? I, I hope I showed, even the little bit of data I showed, I hope I did make the point that they're both involved. In other words, glycative stress happens with or without proteolytic, with or without proteolytic machinery. And the compromise of proteolytic machinery, though, exacerbates it. And we did publish some papers. If you look at the aging cell paper from Gemma Aragonis, um, I think you'll, you'll see more about that. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to cover it. And by the way, before I finish, um, if anybody wants to know more about this project, science training, encouraging peace, please be in touch with me. Other hey, questions? we have one question from Zoom again, Matthew. Hi, Alan, it's Matthew Levine from the American Medical Information Foundation. Um, would there be uh, an equal benefit to eating foods in combination that lower glycemic uh, impact as opposed to simply reducing total amount of glucose yes. intake? Yes, the answer, yeah, I think Walter Willett has published on that, that you can, you know, the, the food, the combinations in which you eat foods also determines how fast various components of those foods get degraded, you know, by the microbiota or the acid in your stomach or intestine, as well as the rates of absorption. So yeah, that's a really important point, Matthew, um, that combinations of foods and the ways we intake, take in those foods are also quite important determinants of the health benefit of a diet. All right, we had a great conversation. We have a last final question from Caroline. Uh, hi, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I'm Caroline from Chris's Lab. So uh, my question pertains, because there was earlier work published uh, in Nature Metabolism showcasing the 
um, photoreceptor outer segment promotes insulin production in the eye. So I'm curious to see in your transcriptomic profile data if you're able to see the uh, correlation between glycative stress and advanced glycation and products uh, effects on retinal degeneration per se, or also this overwhelming um, effect on the high glucose uh, in the eye itself by causing the effects in photoreceptor out of segment and this overall contributing to the whole system collapsing and generating this retinal degeneration. They ultimately may be in AMD patients as well. Um, I think it's several questions. I can answer the last one um, more clearly, I think. And that is that for sure, the difference in the dietary glycemia or the rate at which you deliver the sugar or the rate at which you deliver methylglyoxal, the metabolite of sugar, certainly affects the photoreceptor, photoreceptor integrity. Now, is it affecting the photoreceptor per se? Like something specific within the, within the photoreceptor, something we should probably look at more carefully. Um, in terms of the transcriptomic data, the transcriptomic data we did, I think, is mostly kidney. And um, Sheldon, do we do more than, I don't think, I think we did more kidney and liver. I don't think we have um, transcriptomic data from the eyes, right? Yeah, we, we did We did the retinas um, and that was the kind of thing that we were expecting to see. We, we didn't see any clear um, signature of insulin signaling in the retinas, but we did see um, a lot of involvement of oxidative um, damage pathways and inflammatory pathways in there. All right, thank you, Dr. Tyler, for the wonderful presentation and the discussion to all today. And uh, let's join me in thanking for the for this today event. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.